Okay, so how is everyone today? Doing all right. Yeah. So this is programming, right? Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Just going to make sure I'm in the right spot. You were a little worried we were in the right spot either. There's a room change. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, there's been a few of those. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm the instructor, Dr. Brady McCary. Uh, I forgot to bring the syllabus today, so we'll we'll bring it on Thursday. It's not a big deal. <clears throat> um, but just briefly, the way the course is structured. What's today? The twenty second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> the structure of the course is that, of course, <laughs> we meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <clears throat> Here's a Tuesday. Here's a Thursday, here's a Tuesday, here's a Thursday. So this is the first Tuesday, uh, and we're meeting in this room. Okay, but all subsequent Tuesdays, that is to say all seven days from now and, and all multiples of seven days from now, we're not going to meet in this room. We're going to meet in um, a computer lab. So here we're going to meet. <coughs> in the Brazos lab uh, in Founders. Okay, so there's a big building on campus called Founders. Uh, on the first floor, on the first level, there's a computer lab and in the back of that computer lab is a private computer lab called the Brazos Lab. Okay, that's where we'll go. <clears throat> so what will happen is that we will have a lecture <clears throat> topic. <clears throat> and then in this following Tuesday is when we will meet in lab. And you'll do write programs concerning that, the topic that we lectured over. Okay, so today we're going to lecture a little, we're, we're not meeting in lab obviously, and we're going to lecture a little more uh, to get you prepared for the sort of ideas that we're going to do in this class, but then after that it's always going to be this way. Okay, that is to say like there's another Tuesday right here and another Thursday right here, and the pattern is going to look like this. all the way down the line. <coughs> so we're going to uh, go over <coughs> math problems essentially and we're going to um, use the computer to solve these math problems. So for each new programming language topic I'm going to introduce a new math problem that really you should already be familiar with uh, and we're going to use the machine to solve it. Okay, so it's going to be, everything's going to be learned uh, exactly when it's needed. Okay. <clears throat> so there will also be uh, written homeworks, that is to say, um, over the topics that we do on Thursdays and this particular Tuesday. I'll assign some written homeworks and they'll be due on Tuesdays and also on Thursdays just depending. <coughs> and they're more or less like uh, exercises that you should already be quite familiar with. Okay, so then we're not going to study a lot of new math uh, ideas in this class. Rather, what we're going to do is take math ideas that you're already familiar with and we're going to make the machine do them. So, <clears throat> to, to kind of get the idea of what, how the class is structured, I'd like to explain to you a story that happened to me. So um, I, like almost all of you, was a math major, right? And then I went to graduate school and uh, they said, okay, now you're a teaching assistant, mm -hmm. which, which is fine. Uh, it, it's it's a, good, a good bit of training to be a teaching assistant. <laughs> and what I, what I found out is that 
uh, <laughs> when the students would ask questions, I'd realize, oh, I'm not really sure the answer to that. You know, at that point, you know, I had, a, I had an undergraduate degree in, in math. I was good at calculus, right? Made all A's, that kind of thing. But what happens is, is when you teach a class, okay, the students are going to ask all those little questions that you never got answered. They're going to ask all of them, and then you're going to realize, I'm going to have to come up with an answer to that. <laughs> so what I'm trying to get across to you is that one of the best ways to learn something, to really learn something, is to try and teach someone about the topic. And to a certain extent, the, the less that person knows and assumes, the better it is for the teacher <laughs> to, figure out the, to figure out the matter for themselves. So what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm telling you is that the computer is the, the dumbest thing you'll ever interact with. The computer is just, it's going to do exactly what you say. Okay? And what many of you will find out when trying to get the computer to do things that, that you yourselves find simple. If I were to ask you to do something relatively simple on pencil and paper, every one of you could do it. But many of you are going to find that trying to tell the machine to do it will be very frustrating. Okay, because the machine's going to do exactly what you tell it to do. And if you're not telling it the right way, it's going to do whatever you told it. <laughs> so, in that sense, for many of you, this is going to be one of the most frustrating courses you've ever taken. At least at the beginning, until you start getting the idea of how you're supposed to interact with the machine. Okay, that being said, I hope that many of the fundamental, uh, fundamental techniques and skills that you, know, that you already know will be shored up and built up a lot by you having to explain to the machine just how it's done. Okay, so any question about any of that before we get to some math? Yes? So we meet in here every Thursday. Every Thursday. So we'll meet in here every Thursday, including two days from now. And uh, with the exception of this Tuesday, we'll, we'll be meeting in the Brazos lab from now on. Yes? Does this course assume that we know uh, <coughs> nothing of uh, programming in general? No programming is, oh. is assumed. No programming is assumed. <clears throat> and then I, I take the same, the same teaching strategy in this class as all classes, and that is that you, you model the behavior you want to occur in the student. So when you want to teach some, some, something to anyone, okay, the, one of the best ways uh, is you do it in front of them and say, watch me do it. And then uh, you say, now you do it. And then you give them a slightly different problem and say, now you do that. Until the student figures out all the different moving parts and say, OK. So that's how we're going to do it, is I'm going to give you uh, exercises to do. And I'll provide for you um, source code that, that does something that's similar or related. And you're supposed to take this similar source code and turn it into something that works for the problem that you've been assigned. Because okay, that's the way it works in real life. If you, if you ever find yourself writing software professionally or something like that, <laughs> you just you go somewhere and you find code that is almost doing what you want, and then you change it into something that is doing what you want. Okay, And we'll take that same strategy here. <coughs> Other questions? OK, <clears throat> so another matter that we need to make clear is there's two major pieces of software that we're going to use in this class. One of them is MATLAB. This is a programming language. We'll learn all about it. But in the end, you're going to, you're going to write instructions in a, in, a, in a dialect, a language that MATLAB understands. And then you're going to say, MATLAB, OK, say to MATLAB, OK, MATLAB, I want you to run it. 
and MATLAB's going to do exactly what you told it to do <laughs> every time. Okay, so now there's, a, there's like, I don't know, 70 of you or something like that. And there's going to be on the order of between 30 and 40 assignments, okay, for each of you. But that's how the course will be run, 30 or 40 projects. So that means that there's on the order of like 250 uh, assignments that I have to deal with, right? Because, because there's 70 of y'all and there's about, you know, 40 or whatever. So that's about 250, give or take. In addition to that, each assignment is going to consist of multiple files on the order of five files. Okay? So that means that there's on the order of, uh, what? Now I've lost track. <laughs> files. Yeah, thousands and thousands of files. Okay, and furthermore, furthermore, <clears throat> as the semester progresses, <clears throat> you're you're going to have to submit multiple versions of each file because, in some ways, it'll be working and in some ways it won't. So now each file also has multiple versions. So now we're getting into the thousand, many thousands, and tens of thousands of files. Right? This student that assignment, that particular file for that assignment, this particular version of the file, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it's a, it's a really big uh, chore to keep track of all these files. What certainly never works is, is me saying something like, okay, just email it to me. Can you imagine all the files <laughs> I, would, that I would have everywhere? Okay, that kind of thing doesn't work. Okay, rather, to, to uh, facilitate um, me getting the files to you, you getting your new files back to me, and us being able to track versions and say, oh, well, that version was, was not working for whatever reason, and okay, now you have a new version, now that works. <coughs> there is another tool called Git. This is a source code version management tool. Okay, so then the way it will work is that <clears throat> for each one of you, I'll make a repository on the internet, a particular uh, web service that hosts the Git tool called GitHub. So this is uh, a Git website. Okay, so then I asked all of you to sign up for a GitHub account. Many of you have, but not all of you. I need all of you to do that because if you don't do that, then you won't be prepared to do the work on Tuesday. Okay, and don't just, it, it's not going to be sufficient for you to sign up and then have no idea how to use it on Tuesday because we're already going to be working at that time. Okay, so if you haven't signed up for GitHub, then I need you to do that today. Okay, and then send me the email so that I know your GitHub user and we can get all that process working. So what will happen is that when, it, when a new assignment is available, um, I'll, each one of you will have a GitHub repository. The new assignment will be put into, into the GitHub repository. So that's out on the internet. Okay, the wild internet. Then you go to um, whatever computer you want to use, and you'll, you'll have to have Git installed on that computer. You'll copy the repository. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Y'all are all here for programming, right? Yes. Okay, good. Just making sure. <laughs> I'll let the noise die down for a minute. <laughs> My understanding is that there's about 70 people enrolled in Math 2370. Yeah, this is the only yeah. section. Okay. 
So, now, some of y'all walked in late. That's fine. I'm not going to go back and say what I already said. I'm sorry that you didn't read your email. Um, but I'm recording this lecture, and it's going to be posted on YouTube, so you can, you can, uh, it, all the lectures will be recorded with video, and these sheets of paper will be scanned and posted on the internet, so there's nothing really too much lost. You're just going to have to go back and look at it. Okay. <clears throat> so at any rate, GitHub. Each of you will have a GitHub account. I'll post a new assignment to GitHub. I'll send you a message and say that it's posted. You download it, you read the instructions, you type up some programs, and then you submit them back to GitHub. Okay, and there's a, there's a, there's a nice tool available, and I'll explain how to use that particular tool uh, in a message. I don't want to get into it now because I don't have a computer here. Okay, but there's two major things. Somehow we have to get files back and forth to each other. The mechanism that does that is Git and the website we're going to use is GitHub. Somehow you have to write programs that can be interpreted by a machine. That, that language is, that particular task is going to be facilitated by MATLAB. Okay, so Git itself is agnostic with respect to MATLAB. Uh, Git can be used to manage any kind of thing, any kind of files. So you, one of the, one of the big skills that you might learn from this class is, is that Git exists and how useful it is. Okay. So any question about um, any of this? So I'll, I'll supply all the fine details about, about GitHub and everything in a message probably this afternoon. Okay. And I'll try to, I ex plan to make all of your GitHub repositories this afternoon. Okay. No questions? Yes? No. No exams. You'll have a lot of homework. Sorry? No. No. The, so, a programming class is not really amenable to in-class assignments because what, what's going to happen Y'all don't realize it yet, but like mm, about a third of you have program prior programming experience. Okay, that's going to make this class, at least the beginning of this class, very easy for you. Okay, about a third of you have no programming experience whatsoever, and that's going to be a real chore for 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 those of you that are in that case. And then the middle third of you. Um, are just going to sort sort of be in the middle. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's 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 going to be like, okay, yeah, I I don't have much programming experience, but but I kind of I kind of get it. I kind of get the idea. Okay. Yes. I'm going to make so many postings that you're going to get tired of it. Oh. Um, what else? Uh, hmm. Yes? Are we going to have reading requirements outside of class, or are you just going to go over the book in class, or is that on syllabus? <laughs> uh, so there is a, there is a textbook. Uh, I sent out a link about it. Um, it, it. It's an okay textbook. I don't really like the way programming textbooks are organized. I think it's, I think it's not realistic. Uh, a realistic representation of how people learn how to program. So rather the way it's going to work is each assignment that I write is going to have is going to be more or less self-contained. All instructions that you need will be in that assignment and it'll be right there and ready for you. And you can feel free to look up the analogous topics in the actual textbook. But my intention is that for each assignment you'll read it and all of the stuff that you need will be right there. And at least at, f at first, the way it's going to be is it's going to be something like, uh, so, so here's an example. I, I, I don't speak much Spanish at all. I wish I, I wish I could speak more, but I can say something like, uh, donde es la casa, right? Which, I, as I understand it, means uh, where's the house, right? 
So, donde es la casa? Okay, and then if I tell you another noun is um, baño, right? El baño, the bathroom, right? Then I could say, okay, donde es la casa is where is the house? And el baño is a noun. So I want you to tell me where is the bathroom. Okay, and then I would expect you to say, donde es el baño? Right, so the beginning of the course is going to be like that. Is that I'll give you, it's like I give you a sentence that's, that is well formed, something that MATLAB can understand. And I tell you that that piece represents the bathroom, right, <laughs> or whatever. And I say, now I want you to make it the chair. Okay, so the begin, at least at the beginning, it's going to be this way. It'll speed up real quick, I promise. Other questions? <laughs> okay. Morning. Morning. So, the first thing <clears throat> is that now we have to forget arithmetic entirely. So, what's that? Mm -hmm. Arithmetic, it's gone. So, what I want you to imagine now is that we have no idea what addition is. Okay, we have no idea what addition is. Rather, um, we only have uh, three things. We only have three things. We, uh, we have equality. Uh, equality. Uh, four things, I guess, to make it easier. We have zero. We have uh, a predecessor function. <coughs> and we have a successor function. Okay, so this one is the predecessor function, the one that comes before, okay, will denote that uh, this is, so let me say it cleanly like this. What's the predecessor of 10? Nine. Nine is, is 10's predecessor. And what is the successor of 10? 11. 11, okay. Good. So what we want is we want... Uh, a process, a function, that will add two numbers, but we're only allowed to uh, check for equality. We know what zero is. We, we, given any number, we can find its predecessor or its successor. Given any integer, we can find its predecessor or successor. Uh, but otherwise, it is strictly forbidden to do something like 10 plus 13. That's not allowed. Okay, we, we're not, we don't even know what 10 and 13 are. Okay? So, <clears throat> here is addition. So, addition is going to be, uh, so in the first place, the naturals. Our definition of the natural numbers is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, Dot, dot, dot. So all the naturals, starting at zero. So you should always, in any math class, when one of the instructors defines the naturals, you should be very careful to note what, whether or not zero is part of the naturals. Okay, so then whether or not it is part of the naturals is a lot of times a matter of convention, sometimes of convenience. Uh, but in this class, we're going to take zero to be a natural number. We're going to define the addition function. Uh, what do we want to call it? Add? Okay. How <clears throat> about A? That's good. That way it's just one letter. And what we want to do is we want to be able to add any two naturals. So the signature of the A function is naturals cross naturals 
to naturals. Okay, so then this, <coughs> this kind of thing, this bit right here, is called a function signature. It denotes what kind of input the function accepts. So this means that it accepts two arguments. The first one is a natural, and the second one is a natural. So these are inputs. Or, to use more math mathematician language, this is the domain. And this is the range. So let's think about it. We want to be able to have a function that accepts two arguments, m and n, and they're both naturals. And we want to define a function where we're, we can only test for equality, and we only know what 0 is. Okay, So we don't know what, for example, 13 is. And um, we can only use predecessors and successors. So what we want is we want this to be m plus n. Right? But we can't write m plus n because, because that's not allowed. We can only use predecessors and successors. So what do you think? How could we, how could we, how could we do it? Yeah? I don't know what you mean by loop. Oh. Oh. <laughs> of course I know what you mean, but, <laughs> but, but uh, we can't do that. Can't do that, yeah? Yeah, but that, that was sort of the approach I was going to go with. Okay. Just find successor of the successor m times or n times. Okay. Uh, so what I want is a mathematical function. Yes? Uh, so let's start, and if n is 0, we'll return 10. Okay. So you're telling me that we're going to have a piecewise defined function. So you're, you're telling me that the answer is n under what condition? when m is 0. So <clears throat> is, it, is it permissible for us to be checking for this? Yeah, because we have equality, and we know what 0 is. So we can check for equality to 0. And it is, I think we can all agree, true that m plus n it is n when m is 0. That's a fact. OK. Now what? If that's the approach we're taking, then we should probably yeah. put in that if m plus n equals like j plus k, then m and uh, hold up, hang on, I'm trying to figure out how to pra phrase this. Okay. If m plus n equals j plus k, then oh, or no, 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 sorry. <laughs> So I'll have to stop you there because we can't even we can't even write m plus n, right? Yeah. That's not even permissible. Yeah. If m is equal to one, then the answer is uh, the successor of, of n. I agree with that. So. Just do that for the case. Okay. So. But wait, I thought we didn't know what one was. That's true too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we can't do that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, what do you think? Should we define it the other way, where if n equals zero, then it's m, or just defining one? Yeah. We could do that. Why, why not? Let's write it. Uh, so this is th this case that I'm writing is not necessary. We don't need this case, uh, but I but I agree that it is it is logically consistent. If if either one of them is zero, then the answer is the other one. I agree with that. Yes. If we have like m is equal to the predecessor of zero, do we say that that's equal to the predecessor of m or successor of that? So like the successor of zero is equal to m. Thus, you have the, uh, the successor of n, or no? Not, not quite. Not quite. We're getting there, though. We're almost there. What do you think? Uh, could we evaluate a of the uh, predecessor of m and the successor of n? Ah, let's look at it. Look. So, what do we want to call the predecessor function? Let. Is it okay? I'll, I'll write it. I'll write it with P and S. So the predecessor of which one do we want? We'll do the success. We'll 
do the successor of <coughs> m and the predecessor of n. So this is otherwise. So now, what do you think about this? Is this a complete definition for addition of, of naturals? Let's think about it. How would it work? I claim that this is <clears throat> a complete definition. So let's, let's try some examples. <clears throat> so what if I asked you to evaluate, say, uh, A of 0 and 5. So in the first place, I think we all know that 0 plus 5 is 5. Okay. But <clears throat> what I want to get from you is which case are we using. So let's, let's name these cases. So this is, we'll call this the first case, the second case, and the third case. Strictly speaking, we don't need the second case. So uh, in this case, what are, what, for this evaluation, what case are we using? We're using case uh, one, because th that's when the first argument is zero. Okay, so then it, so this, this one evaluates immediately just to five. The answer is five. Okay. <clears throat> what if we do something slightly more interesting? Say like the addition of mm, say three and four. So I think we can all agree that it's seven. Okay, but remember we're trying to explain this to a computer. Okay, the computer doesn't even know what addition is. All it knows is how, given any integer, it can get the next one. G given any natural, it can get the, the uh, successor or the predecessor. So what case are we in here for this one? We're in case three. We're in case three, which means that we're going to have to evaluate the, <coughs> the A function again. What will be the first argument? Four. four. Why will the first argument be four? Because it says that we are to, we are to input the successor of the first argument. <laughs> Good. So what we're saying, what we're saying is that I don't know what, what the addition of 3 and 4 is, but it's surely the same as the addition of 4 and 3. Okay. If we were to evaluate this, what is the answer? Five and two. This is the addition of 5 and 2. And then? 6 and 1. 7 and 0. And now what case are we in? Uh, yeah, case 2. Uh, so the answer is 7. So what I'd like for you to observe is that on this first one that we did, we went immediately to case number 1. Case number one gave us that evaluation. Okay. For these, we needed case three, and then 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 we needed case two. Two? Yeah, two. So what I'd like for you to observe is that when you're evaluating the A function, if you ever find yourself in case one or two, that means that there's no, more, there's no more computation to do. You have reached the end of the maze, if you like. But any time you find yourself in case three, that means that you have to proceed a little further. And I'd like for you to observe that uh, we only did it with three and four. Right? But can you see that this would work for any uh, naturals? And it wouldn't work for any integers, why would it not work for any integers? It doesn't have any notion of a negative number. Well, <laughs> be, well, for one thing, the signature of the function does not allow for negative integers. But suppose that we just disregarded that and just started jamming negative integers into it. Yes? You can on the predecessor of negative numbers forever. Right. Yeah. 
So, so which one of them asked for the predecessor? This one asked for, uh, the second argument asked for the predecessor. So I think we can all agree that 10 plus negative 2 is 8, right? Uh, but if we were to use this definition, if we were to use this definition, then we would say that, okay, the sum of 10 and negative 2 is the same as the sum of 11 and negative 3, is the same as the sum of 12 and negative 4, is the same as an infinite regression, right? Because we're never going to terminate. Does everyone see that there's, that there's a little bit of a problem there? Yes? Yeah. Now, if we extended the program to, like, to deal with negative numbers, could we just put in a condition that would make the negative number or the positive number approach zero using either predecessor or successor, whichever one's appropriate? So we're going to have to do all manner of, of playing around like that. In the end is, is the answer. But, but in the first place, I, what I want you to observe here and now is that this works, this particular definition works for this signature. If you change the signature around, this definition is not going to work in the way that you <laughs> might hope. Okay? But yes, you, you know, we could, we could try and be more clever about it and say, okay, well, we'll have lots of cases now. What if one of them is negative? Oh, that's the one we're going to whatever. Yes, we'll have to do all of that. Other questions? Okay, so now... <clears throat> So for, for one thing, we're going to write a program that, that does this, okay? That this is going to be one of the very first programs you're uh, required to do. So now, without, without, any, sh without any shame, uh, I'll just say, okay, we can talk about addition now. now. Now we really can say that 23 plus 70 is 93 or whatever it is, okay? Without any, without any shame, okay? Furthermore, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into it because I want to cover other things. I'm also going to extend that to all of the reels. We can talk about adding reels, okay, in this class. But you're, <laughs> you're still going to have to make the machine do a lot of uh, things. Okay. Let's try multiplication. So we just did addition. Multiplication. <clears throat> so this is what we have. We have uh, real addition. That's what we have. And from, from real addition, uh, we want to be able to construct something like multiplication. Okay. So we want to make <clears throat> want to make a function m for multiply <laughs> want to make a function m for multiply uh, that has signature naturals cross reals to reals <coughs> which does the following thing which does uh, n multiplied by x for a natural n and uh, a real x okay but we're not allowed to use multiplication we can use addition so that means that now we can write the plus symbol and we don't have to write the A thing. Okay. So how can we do it? What do you think? Well, just following from the previous one, we should define... Or do we, we still have zero defined, correct? We, ha we have the additive identity and the multiplicative identity. Okay. So f just following from the last one, we should set up a case where if one of them is zero, then it should spit out zero. Okay. I like that. But before we get there, I want you to recall the math definition is that oops, uh, 
So uh, what do we have here? What am I trying to say? 1 times x. 1 times x. Well, that, that means x. Right? And then 2 times x, what does that mean? Well, yes, but there you have it. It means x plus x. So that's what it means. So this is a shorthand for that. What does 3x mean? X plus x. Very good. x plus x plus x. So what I want you to observe is that if, if we were to write 2370x, then that would mean that we'd have to write x with pluses in between 2,370 times. Right? Okay. So I'd like to point out something, and that is that do you observe that the horizontal space on either side of the equal is uneven? That is totally not my style. So <laughs> what is, if this, if 1x means that you make one copy of x and add them all up, and 2x means you make two copies of x and add them all up, and 3x means make three copies of x and add them all up, then what does 0x mean? Zero copies. You make zero copies of x and add them all up. Add them all up, but you can't add them up. So would that cross the program? Well, currently. Well, what I want, what I want is I want to get this structure to be clear. Okay. So it was, it was clear while we were doing this. Like I, I think all of you could, could agree that we could continue writing this triangle going down. Okay. What I want, what I want is for you to tell me what do I need to, how do I need to fix it up so that it still works? Oh, yes. There you have it, because that's what fixes the horizontal space, right? <laughs> so this is this is the the real definition here. Okay. So that being said, <clears throat> let's define the multiplication function. Multiplication of, <coughs> pardon me, uh, yeah, okay. <coughs> Multiplication of n and x. So how can we do it? Yes? Okay. So in the case that n is 0, the answer is 0. And I'll go ahead and throw out the other one, right? It is also the case that the answer is 0 in the case that x is 0. So if either one of them is 0, the answer is 0. Okay. So those are out now. Okay, so I, I think what you're saying is that the answer is uh, n if x is 1, and the answer is uh, what? Uh, x if n is 1. Okay, I agree with all of those. So now we've exhausted all the identities, right? The, the additive and the multiplicative identity, so now that's all gone. Yes? So for otherwise, okay. Okay, so let's let's write that down. Let's see let's see if that does what what we think. So the predecessor of n and then x plus x. So we're going to write this and and see what happens. So this is a candidate. Okay. Well, let's do it. Yes? This is predecessor. Okay, gotcha. So, 
Yeah. So yeah, we have we have subtract one. <clears throat> so let's let's try this out. Let's see let's see what this would do. Uh, so the multiplication of say three and five. So I think we can all agree that the answer is fifteen. Did I? Is that, that going to work? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the answer is We I think we can all agree that the answer should be fifteen. Now let's follow the definition. Okay. So which case will will we be in? will be in the last one, right? The otherwise case. So that means that we're going to have to say that this is equal to a different evaluation. What will the first argument be? Two. And what will the next argument be? Ten. Okay. We're still in the otherwise case, right? So what will the first argument be? One. And what will the second argument be? Twenty. And now we're in not the otherwise case. Which one are we in? Four. That one, right? Yeah. Okay, we're in, we're in one of these cases where we exit. And what's the answer? 20. <laughs> okay, so now my request of you is that is, so is this right? Do we have the definition right? Clearly not. Okay, it's not right. But this is what I mean when I say that the machine is going to do exactly what you tell it, right? So I said, let's, yeah. let's, Let's look at it. Let's try it. Could you try n minus one minus one? N minus what? For, for the for the fifth case, could you change it to n minus one minus one? Would that do it? No. no? <laughs> it wouldn't right. work. Fair enough. It wouldn't work. It was worth a shot. But the but the neat thing one of the neat things about the computer is you can you can tell it to do anything and it doesn't care, right? You just you just type something in and then just say, well try that. And then if it's not 15, then okay, that, that wasn't it. Let's try something else. The machine doesn't get offended when you tell it to do something silly. Yes? I'm not, I, I'm not sure I follow. So the, the, the answer to the question is a little complicated. It, it requires a new idea. Do you have it? We do x plus m of n minus 1. Ha <laughs> ha. That, that one. <laughs> OK. Let's try that. Let's see if that will work. That's a little complicated. I, I, I didn't think of it that way. Let's, let's try it that way. So the, that one didn't work. So this one is sad. <laughs> let's try another one. So we'll try n, n and x times it. <clears throat> okay, and we have all the same base cases. So 0, 0, n, and x. So 0, if n is 0, 0. If x is 0, n. If x is 1, and x if n is 1. So that's all those base cases. And then your idea was to say, for the, for the otherwise case, what was it? Oh, OK, OK, good. Now I, now I understand what you're saying. Yeah, this, this is what I had in mind. So what was it? x plus? m of n minus 1. m of n minus 1 x. Okay, and this is otherwise. So is that readable, legible? OK. So let's see if this works. Let's try it with 3 and 5 again. <clears throat> so m of 3 and 5. 
So which case are we in? The otherwise case, right? We're going to start calling it the recursive case. So why are we going to call it the recursive case? Right, so the, the name of this function is m, okay? And in order to evaluate this function m, you have to evaluate this function m, right? So this function is defined in terms of itself. Okay, such a, such a definition is called recursive, okay? A, a self-referential definition. So, so in order to evaluate m of three and five, we need to go to the recursive case. Okay, so according to the recursive case, what do I need to write here? 5 plus m of 2 and 5. So there's more work to do. Okay, we, can't, we can't get it figured out until, um, until the function evaluation is gone. Okay, so that means that this would be 5 plus, and if we wanted to do m of 2 and 5, then what? So it would be another 5, right? And then what? m of 1 and 5, and then what? m of 1 and 5 is 5, according to one of these base cases. So this would be 5 plus 5 plus 5. And then there's no more m, right? We've reached the end of the maze. So now, because we, because we defined addition, this is all a perfectly legitimate thing, so the answer is 15. So, <clears throat> to, make, to make the point clear, let's do another one, but do it uh, quickly. So how about uh, we'll make this one 5 and make this one 2. So, in the end, the way, the way that this function is going to look at it is that we're going to make five copies of two and add them all together. Okay? Just, like, just like this definition right here. This says make three copies of x okay, and add them all to zero. You have a question? So I guess in programming, I guess you can write code however you want. Mm -hmm. So is that how you were just able to take plus x out for just like kind of out of nowhere? Or did, did you do something on this? I'm not sure. So when, when, I, when I say this, I mean this is what we're allowed to use mathematically on paper. Okay. Well, I'm, I meant like down there for the n, n minus 1, and you had x plus x in there for the range part. Here? It didn't work, right? But I'm saying, like, why was he allowed to pick up x? Because usually math calls, I have a rule, but I guess programming is slightly different in some sense. So, I don't know, I might be asking a stupid question. I don't think it's a stupid question. I just don't understand what the question is. So we have, we have real addition. That's what we're allowed to use. Yeah. By virtue of, uh, of us saying that we have real addition, that's what justifies me writing the addition of, these, of this real with itself. Yes? I think he's asking why you can say x plus the function that you're trying to use. Yeah. Ah, okay. That's because the function produces a real. Okay. So, so this, this is a real, and this produces a real when, it, when it's evaluated. So this thing is, is category real, and so is this. So that means that this addition is real addition. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so according to the definition on the previous page, the way this should work is it should end up making five copies of two and adding them all together. Is that what it's going to do? Yeah. Let's, let's write it out very tediously and make, make it so. <laughs> so what the definition is saying, that this is two plus the multiplication of four and two which is 2 plus 2 plus the multiplication of 3 and 2, which is 
2 plus 2 plus 2 plus the multiplication of 2 and 2, which is 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus the multiplication of 1 and 2, but that happens to be one of our base cases. The multiplication of 1 and 2 is 2 because 1 is the multiplicative identity. So this would be 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. Did it end up making five copies of 2 and adding them all together? Yes. Terrific. Okay, so from this point on, that means that it is, we can now multiply any real by any natural. Okay. Now, th the definition to extend it to from any real to the multiplication of any real and any integer is straightforward because if we have the reals, then we have negation, right? And every integer has the property that it is a natural or its negation is a natural. So every, every integer has that property. Uh, so negative 5 is an integer, but it's not natural. However, the negation of negative 5 is 5, which is. So if you wanted to multiply negative 5 and any x, then you could multiply 5 and that x to get a real and then negate. And then you'd have the multiplication of negative 5 and x. So now, now I'm saying that from this, from this it's, a, it's just a small skip and a jump to having uh, the product of any natural, or sorry, any integer and any real. Okay. Any question about this? Okay. <coughs> now let's do exponentiation. I have a question. Yes? Does MATLAB have multiplication in it? Or yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Uh, and we're going to be using it. We're going to be using it, for sure. <laughs> but um, one of the programs you'll have to write um, among them is that um, you'll have to write, a, you'll have to write a, uh, a program that accepts a function that computes the predecessor and another function that computes the successor, and you'll have to use those in, and those only. And then I'll write a function which examines your function and sees whether or not you did that. Okay, so then, s similarly, uh, other little things. Yes? Do we have to, like, write out all the logic steps like we're doing right now whenever we turn in these assignments, or do we just write, like, the piecewise beginning and then you tell us to write? So, the mat you so for the code, you'll be typing in MATLAB. So none of this yeah. looks exactly like MATLAB. MATLAB has its own idiosyncratic way of writing stuff. But... What I, what, I, what I will suggest and claim is that you can and will write a MATLAB function that is almost just like this. Okay, except, except it'll be in MATLAB syntax. <coughs> Other questions? Okay, exponentiation. So we have a real product. So we have real product. And what we want to do is we want uh, a function, which I guess we'll call E, of n and x. Uh, well, yeah, it has signature naturals cross reals to reals. <coughs> and what we want is we want it to be x to exponent n. That's what we want. But we can't write that, right? This, I'm, I'm writing this down so that you understand what it is we're going toward, but, but we don't have this. We don't have, we don't have exponentiation. And I'd like for you to recall the definition of all of this. <coughs> recall that x to exponent 1 means what? 
It means x. What does x to exponent 2 mean? It means, yes, make two copies of x and combine them with product. What does x to exponent 3 mean? It means make three copies of x and combine them all in product. Yes? Well, let's look at that. Is it, I, ho I hope you're getting this, the sense that we've said all this before. <laughs> yeah, you see the horizontal space? Yeah, good, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can, now you can see it, right? So, so, x to exponent 10 would mean make 10 copies of x and combine them all in a product. Right? That's what it means. But, to make this definition work, to, to make it to where it looks right, we have to include zero, because zero is a natural. What would x to zero mean? Exactly. So this is, this is what the kind of thing that we're talking about. So now we want to write the exponentiation function that does this. So can you do it? So I want you to do it right now. You should be able to look at the multiplication function that's on the previous page or so, and you should be able to write something that is markedly similar to it. Okay, so let's go over the base cases. That is to say, when we happen to have one of them is a zero or a one, where it's real easy to deal with. So what about the case when, say, n is one? Then you get x, right? Is everyone, everyone's okay with that? Uh, what about the case when n is zero? Now this one's a little bit tricky, right? Just a little bit. Let's think about it here. We're all math majors. There you have it. Well, so l let me say it like this. If n is 0 and x isn't, then what's the answer? One. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going we're going to leave the case when x is uh, when x is we're going to leave that case undefined so that it is not defined. <clears throat> okay. What's another case that's easy to deal with? Okay. It's one. If x is one, I agree with that. What's another case that's easy to deal with? Yeah. Kill? Like. Make it blow up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, MATLAB, MATLAB you, you could tell MATLAB, like you could type, type for MATLAB and say, I want you to evaluate 0 to exponent 0, and it'll just vomit. It'll, it, it'll be, it, I mean, it'll crash. Not crash, what it'll do is say, you know, I can't, I just can't do that. Not today, right? <laughs> okay, and you'll have to avoid that kind of thing. <clears throat> So there's, another, there's at least one more that's easy to deal with. When it's zero if 
if x equals 0 and n is not 0? Right. So if x is 0 and n isn't, then the answer is 0. I think that's all the cases that are easy to deal with. OK, now what? So now let's see, does, does it really do what we suspect and want? Does it really do it? There's only one way to, d to confirm or deny that, and that's just to test it out. So let's try a relatively easy example. How about, uh, say, 3 and 5 here? So that means that we want 5 to exponent 3, which 5 to exponent 3, that means that it's going to have to make 3 copies of 5 and combine them all in a product. Okay, so let's see if it does that. So for 3 and 5, we're in the otherwise case. We're in the otherwise case, which means that it is the second argument multiplied by the function evaluated at the predecessor of the first argument and the second argument. Okay, so then have we made it all the way to the end yet? Not yet, because we've still got the E thingy. So then this would be 5 multiplied by, what is, what is uh, e of 2 and 5? 5 times e of 1 and 5. Okay, what is e of 1 and 5? Five. 5, right, that's one of these cases. So this would be 5 times 5 times 5. Is that in fact 5 to exponent 3? Yeah. It is. Terrific. So now we have the ability to exponentiate something, even if we don't have an exponentiation operator, even if we only have multiplication. We can exponentiate things now. Okay. Yes, MATLAB has an exponentiation operator. <coughs> what about the undefined case, though? How do you fix where if it's undefined? Oh, wait, is that why you put the x not equal to 0 the n not equal to zero? Like if it was zero to zero? Right. It's undefined. But, oh, but that's like not in the definition. Yeah. So like that, that's all you need to do is just leave it undefined? That's what we're doing here. Okay. okay. Fair enough. So in, in MATLAB, so if, uh, uh, let me address your concern this way. Maybe you're concerned how do you do this kind of thing in MATLAB? Okay. Yeah. So, so the way that we'll do it in MATLAB is you'll write a function and you'll have to check the arguments and make sure that they adhere to the correct signature. And I want you to say, I want you to, your program to produce an error that says, no, you can't do that. That's not permissible. You can't, you can't do zero to exponent zero. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Here we go. So now we have iterated composition. So now we have functions. Suppose that we have, we have functions uh, and composition. <clears throat> that is to say, uh, given functions f and g, which have compatible domains and ranges, uh, we can compute, uh, we have F composed with G. Okay, the composition of functions. <clears throat> so now, I'd like for you to recall. Uh, 
that f function now. So this f is a function. And when you give a function an exponent, that just means f. Okay, what does it mean when you give function exponent 2? No, not, not, so that, that particular convention you're talking about, usually you have parentheses around the number. Huh? Are you applying it twice? Yes. So this means f composed with f. Okay, and <clears throat> f with exponent 3 means f composed with f composed with f, etc. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so my question to you is, though I think you can imagine it continues, right? My question to you is then, well, what does what does this mean? So this means this first one means give whatever argument you have, give it to f, and see what f does with it. This one means whatever argument you have, give it to f, take the output and give it back to f, and then that's what you want. And if you had 10 of them in a row, it says give it to the first f, then take the output and give it to the next one, take the output and give it to the next mm -hmm. one, et cetera. Yes? So wouldn't that be the argument that you put in originally? Yes. So what is, so just like when we were talking about addition, what red thing did I have to write right here? Zero. I had to write zero because zero is the additive identity. When we were talking about multiplication, uh, what did I have to write? No, when I was talking about, well, okay, whatever. When I was talking about the other one, what red thing did I have to write here? One, because one is the multiplicative identity. What red thing do I have to write right here? What is the compositional identity? It's not x. There's no x's here. You can't write x. That doesn't make any sense. G. <laughs> well, it depends on how you denote it. So, so. I'll write it as ID because that's a pretty common one. Yeah, it's the identity function. The identity function. Have we defined like an inverse function yet? No, we oh, haven't. No, 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 no. That would require composition. Yeah, yeah we don't. We're not talking about inverses. So I'll remind you that the identity function is the function which takes x and gives you what? x. x. It's the function that says, here's that argument you gave me. I handed it right back to you. OK, so that shouldn't be there, right? Yeah. OK, <clears throat> we're out of time. So what I want you to do is I want you to write a function, just like we did for multiplication and addition but I want you to write a function that would accept an argument and produce, uh, accept an n and an x and produce fn of x. Okay, see, see how you could do it. Okay, see you on Thursday and we'll be here again. Yes? Yeah.